We've been talking to Russian journalists, a lot of them independent, who have moved to YouTube to try to escape censorship. The Kremlin is tightening its grip on the media and critics of the Russian president. Independent media in Russia now silenced by the Kremlin. I don't like German journalists, actually, because in Russia, uh, for now, it's not a good word, actually. And they've been pretty successful in doing so. But now people like Irina, who we just talked to, are now on this list. За кофе 20 евро не переводить на карточку, чтобы ты стал иногентом. Сейчас пью иностранный кофе. Я вот думаю, я оказывается ли на меня иностранное влияние или нет? Can I share my screen with you really quick? Yeah, go okay. Ahead. So this, one, this right here? Yeah, that's her. Okay. 52, yeah. Okay, 52. This list is a list of foreign agents, people who are either receiving funding from or influence from foreign entities. They are now branded as foreign agents within Russia. They're required to put that they are foreign agents on their tweets and on their YouTube videos. Everyone knows that they are a foreign agent. But really, what foreign agent means is Putin doesn't like what they say. The critical piece here is that you are subject to fines and potentially a criminal investigation for non-compliance. So if you're on this list and you don't start putting a little disclaimer, if they choose to prosecute, they have grounds to do so. And that's the, the scary part. I've been talking to our story producer who is a Russian journalist who is helping connect us to what's going on on the ground. So of the people we've talked to, who's on this list now? They're all on it now. They're, everyone. They're all on Rina it. was the only one who was off of it before, and now she's on it too. Yeah. So everyone we've talked to is a foreign agent, according to the Russian foreign government. Agent. Yeah, and Michael is actually has a warrant for his arrest in Russia. This list is a new weapon for this regime to censor voices that it doesn't like. The list is huge, and it is growing every day. This is, this is getting bad. It's getting really, really bad. In this story, I want to show you what life in Putin's Russia is like today. Not fed through my Western lens or through Western media, but rather through the lens of the people who are living there. I reached out to all of you looking for people in Russia to tell me what it is like right now to be in this country. And what I'm seeing through all of this is a place that is increasingly turning back to the old Soviet days. In the process, cutting off one of the most important parts of any society, its flow of information. Everything changed when the war started. Real quick, before we uh, dive fully into today's video, I want to thank today's sponsor, who is a longtime supporter of this channel. Thank you, BetterHelp, for sponsoring today's video. I've said it once and I will continue to say it. I am a super giant, massive believer and fan of therapy. Therapy has changed my life. I believe therapy is a thing that in 50 years, we will look back and be like, remember back in the 2020s when like there were people who didn't take their mental health seriously? Like, I really believe in therapy. And BetterHelp is a platform that is making therapy more accessible to people. Normally with therapy, you call around to different offices and you see if it works with your insurance and you do all this stuff and it's complicated and hard and difficult. With BetterHelp, all you do is download an app, sign up, and you answer a couple of questions. And then BetterHelp matches you with someone in their massive network of tens of thousands of licensed therapists that are not just in your city, but all around. They will find the best match for you. Oh, and you don't have to be talking to them if you don't want to. You can do a phone call, you can do a video chat, you can do a text message if you want for your therapy. You can choose the format that works for you. If you don't like your therapist, you can switch at any time for free, which is another giant perk that if you've ever done traditional therapy is just like unheard of. I believe therapy is for everyone. I am someone who didn't have a clinical mental health condition, but like went to therapy and saw the benefits of how it can change your life. I really, really believe that therapy needs to be more accessible, more normalized. And that is why I believe in what BetterHelp is doing. If you want to try out BetterHelp, there's a link in my description. It is uh, betterhelp.com slash Johnny Harris. Clicking that link helps support this channel. It also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp, so you can try it out at a discount, see if it works for you. Let's dive into this story about Russia and Russian YouTubers and information in Russia. It is a fascinating one. Let's go. We got tons and tons of community submissions for this piece, like hours and hours worth. Hi, Joni. Hi. Hello. Hello. 
Hello. Hi. Hello, Johnny. Hi, Johnny. Hi, Johnny. Hello. Holly. Hello, I'm Russian. I'm from Russia. I'm a student from Moscow, Russia. So let me get you up to speed on what's going on here, how we got to a Russia that looks like this. And of course, it has to do with this guy. It's easy to think that Vladimir Putin is just this big bad dictator who's existed forever ruling Russia. But no, Vladimir Putin was elected to become the president of Russia in 2000. Back then, Russia was a pretty different place than it is today. He served two four-year terms, and by 2008, Putin's time was up. The Constitution of Russia expressly prohibits anyone from being able to be president for more than two terms, like here in the United States. But Putin wasn't ready to give up on power, so he found a little loophole. The Constitution doesn't say anything about someone taking a break after their second term and then coming back and being president again. So Putin pulled this move. He got this guy to become president for four years, while he, Putin, became the prime minister. And this was a good time for the Russian economy, which was opening up to foreign investment, and the economy was growing nicely. This new president of Russia sat with President Obama and had like a burger and fries here in Washington, D.C. in an effort to reset relations between the two countries. But while Putin was taking this little four-year break, he was not loving all of this. As the 2012 election approached, he needed to get back into the top job. So he convinced this president not to run again and instead to back Putin's presidential bid. In exchange, they would just sort of switch places and this guy would become the prime minister. And that's exactly how it worked. Putin won the 2012 election and these two just switched places. Some people have called this like castling, like in chess. It's the only time in the game where you're allowed to move two pieces at once. And it's a move that's meant to protect the king. So it's 2012 and a bunch of people in Russia are on to what Putin's up to. They take to the street in protest of what was clearly one man accumulating ultimate power in their country. All in an election that outside observers concluded was not fully free and fair. But none of this mattered because by 2012 Putin is back in power and he's not going to play nice anymore. He cracks down on these protests and he takes his control of the country to a new level, making sure that he'll never be challenged again. <laughs> They started arresting people like me and my friends, regular protesters. First by dozens, then by hundreds, and then by thousands across the country. Russia, the musical, and Russia right now are two different countries. The central election of Putin like became kind of a milestone, and this is like really huge historical events that um, divided our country, like our history, uh, into you know before and after. So that was like 10 years ago. And since then, the people in Russia have kind of experienced the kind of proverbial frog in boiling water thing, where year after year, they've seen a long but slow transformation of their society, their rights, and perhaps most notably, where they get their information. In the past several years, it's, it's became a norm to get beaten up at a protest, to get up to 15 days, 30 days of detention for taking part in a protest. Every single year, people's perception of what the government can do to them shifted to accepting more and more repressive actions. And this is where that list that I was looking at kind of started, and it started small and bureaucratic. Putin's party passes this foreign agent law, basically saying that any organization in Russia that receives any money from any other country is now required to put a big badge on anything they publish that says that like, hey, I'm a foreign agent. And if they don't comply, they have to pay a huge fine. At first, this just seems like a bureaucratic thing, but this law would lay a foundation to help the Putin regime censor whoever they didn't like. All types of media outlets, bloggers, TV channels, and even newspapers that don't support Putin's Ukraine invasion are labeled as foreign agents. Which in Russian sounds more like foreign spy. It means that anything published by those outlets now has to include a huge disclaimer, declaring something like, this article was written by a foreign agent that obeys the West and spreads its false propaganda. The next year, they passed this gay propaganda law, claiming that they must urgently protect Russia's children against the West's moral decay by prohibiting the discussion or promotion of homosexuality and LGBT rights among minors. You could call this the original don't say gay law. And I remember this very loud case when they outlawed basically uh, LGBTQ plus youth support group and they took the founders to court. It was incredibly stressful for many, many people because they were doing very good work. They were helping young people who were confused and scared and 
maybe not accepted for their identity and they were taken to court for it. As part of LGBTQ plus community, I can say that we don't have any rights or freedoms in Russia. It's just not for us. And then in the next year, 2014, Putin annexes Crimea. Russian President Vladimir Putin casts his shadow across the boundary of Europe and Russia. Russian troops spreading out throughout the uh, strategic Crimean Peninsula. And this is where we start to see a giant disconnect between like what happens in Russia and here in the West. Here in the West, we saw this land grab and we were like, what is happening? This is so terrible. But the fact is, most Russians love this. I mean, look at this guy's popularity. It springs up to an all-time high after he invades and steals land. And this is because Putin is really good at appealing to a certain yearning within a big part of the Russian population. I mean, listen to his annexation speech where he calls Crimea, quote, an inseparable part of Russia. He claims that he has this firm conviction that is based on truth and justice. Like Putin is a good storyteller. He is a strong magnetic leader. And we lose out on that because we don't understand his language and he just looks like a villain. But many Russians, a lot of them who remember the chaos of the post-Soviet years, see Putin as a strong leader. Someone who's willing to stick up for Russian identity and values in a chaotic and changing world. So yeah, he's super popular, but then the West punishes him by cutting him off from the economy as punishment for stealing land and bankrolling a war in the east of Ukraine. And this war in Ukraine drags on instead of being a quick victory like he hoped. But if there's anything I've learned about Vladimir Putin in these years, it's that when he takes a loss, he just responds by doubling down. By 2016, Russian society is starting to look much less free than it was four years earlier. Putin's government has now passed laws forcing internet providers to store user data and to cooperate with Russian law enforcement, even if it means sharing people's private encrypted messages. One thing that aspiring dictators know is that staying in power means controlling what people think. And to do that, you must control the information that they have access to. He understood that he should take under control every media outlet in Russia, radio, TV, internet, everything. The first target is Russian TV channels. He chips away at these until almost all of them are owned or influenced by the government. In Washington, by the words of Sergei Lavrov, the attempt of the current administration to accuse Moscow of its own rights. Eventually, there's only one non-state TV channel standing. But then, suspiciously, Russia's cable providers stop airing this TV channel to 18 million Russian homes, effectively censoring it completely. They get evicted from their studio in downtown Moscow. And by 2015, every television in Russia is showing a version of reality that this one man wants them to see. Контрпродуктивный акт агрессии. Именно так расценили в Москве ведение Бараком Обамой новых санкций в отношении России. Якобы за вмешательство в выборы в США и давление на американских дипломатов. I mean, you're watching this video on the internet and you're like, who cares, it's TV, no one watches TV. But in Russia, people do watch TV. 70% of the population, which is literally like 100 million people, get their news from TV. TV that they're watching daily. Like in a lot of parts of the world, the television is the gateway that people have to see the world, to understand the world, to make up their minds about the world. We cannot underestimate TV. A hundred million people. If you like a Russian grandma and like you cook in dinner and oh, there's TV on the background. This is just like their only source of news, like television. And it's terrible. Uh, propaganda became much more prominent on TV. It was basically the only narrative you could find. There is no TV channels in Russia that not under the state, that not uh, under the Kremlin. Nowadays, Russian TV is just one big endless storm of different kinds of propaganda. I just cannot watch Russian TV. It's just impossible to watch it myself. Штаб Владимир Путин назвал российских военных, которые участвуют в специальной операции на Украине, и привел конкретные примеры подвигов. Стрелы со стороны украинских националистов. В Донецке вновь обесточена шахта, а под землей находится более ста человек. I mean, let's just clarify one thing. Every country has totally polarized, slanted television. Like here in the US, we have news channels that are totally slanted to one side or the other, and will often just 
toe the line of whoever's in power if they align with their views. Like this Russian guy spewing propaganda on Russian state TV kind of doesn't sound that different to like Tucker Carlson talking about Donald Trump. The reality is that all information has a bent, has a bias. I, I really believe that. The difference is that this is all they get. You can't click away to an opposing channel to get another view. I don't speak Russian, which is a big bummer because I really wanted to just like watch a bunch of Russian TV and like see what it feels like. Luckily, Putin's government has me covered. Check this out. The US plan is to drag this war out as long as they possibly can. This war is a war of the United States against Europe. The Russian government has built a full-blown international news outlet that is Russian state TV, but in English and a bunch of other languages. It's called Russia Today. And boy, is it a treat. There is no hope under heaven for any Ukrainian military victory against the Russian professional army. Ukrainian fighters caught on camera using ambulance for transportation. This stuff is super valuable, actually, because not only does it like teach us what propaganda looks like, but it also gives us an alternative view on how these events are being seen, which is really helpful for questioning your own biases and trying to make sense of how information works in this world. RT was banned from YouTube for being full-blown propaganda, but they still publish their videos, and I found where? Bingo, RT. They publish a lot of videos, like tons and tons and tons of videos. I mean, they're a news outlet, and a lot of it is Putin on Russia's support for African nations. The anti-hero of the year. Oh, and look, we've got Tucker Carlson. Has made it official. They're calling him not only the, the person of the year, but also the most influential person in Europe. And it's notable because there have been a number of people who have been quick to rush to social media, calling out this decision, saying that they don't agree with it, and also referring to the hypocrisy surrounding it. And that includes Fox News host Tucker Carlson. Take a listen to what he had to say about it. So Zelensky has no interest in freedom and democracy. In fact, Zelensky is far closer to Lenin than to George Washington. He is a dictator over the past years. Yeah, so there's some alignment here. I mean, a lot of this stuff is just regular news. It's not all propaganda. But it's when you get into how RT is covering the war in Ukraine that you kind of start to feel like you're on drugs. People here feel terrorized by the Ukrainian military who continue shelling them every day. Ukraine hates us and that's it. They want to destroy us. Ukrainian nationalist forces uh, continue shelling civilians here in the city of uh, Donetsk. Like this documentary that is just wild. It's called Nuclear Blackmail. And it's a story about a Ukrainian power plant that, a reminder, Russia invaded and is occupying but this whole documentary is about the poor locals who are being attacked by brutal Ukrainians. Totally unprovoked. Even though it's Russia who's occupying the country. Okay, but wait, pause. We just have to have a moment. I want to go on with the story, but I also want to just say something right here because it's actually really important. I've been watching a lot of Russian TV for this story. And while it's really easy to roll your eyes at this stuff or laugh at it or condemn it because some of it is just full on fake news, a lot of this is actually more subtle, not full blown inventing the truth. And in fact, I think the value of watching this is it shows you the kind of cherry picking of facts and interpretations that they're able to do on their side. And then you start to see the same type of cherry picking that media companies here in the West do for the worldview that suits them. And you start to realize that all journalism is at some point cherry picking. You're deciding what to put in and what to leave out. And it often comes with biases. I see the same type of cherry picking from Western news organizations. Hell, I, I do this. It's a lot easier for me to publish a story to you about how bad Vladimir Putin is than to cover, I don't know, the potential war crimes committed by Ukrainian soldiers against Russian soldiers recently based on a video that the New York Times broke. Like, I don't wanna look into that. That doesn't really line up. That's a lot harder thing to cover. It's easier for me to cover the narrative that fits with what you all want to see and what you all believe. And that's kind of scary. Watching Russian TV, it's not something I recommend, but I'm saying that this propaganda can help wake us up to what sensors we need to have on when we're ingesting information. So yeah, stay skeptical and curious and resist the urge of just blind side taking that's my PSA for today. Let's get back to the story. The 
United States is interested in severing ties between Russia and Europe and also China. Okay, so back to our timeline. It's 2017, 100 million Russians are being fed a version of reality that their autocratic leader wants them to see. But there's one place that Vladimir Putin hasn't reached yet. And that is the place that you are currently right now, this place called YouTube.com. So by 2017, if you wanna be an independent news outlet in Russia, your life looks like this. At the top of every single tweet, you have to put this, which basically says, I am a foreign agent. This message material is created and or distributed by a foreign mass media performing the functions of a foreign agent. Like you can't even put a tweet here because all of your characters are taken up by the foreign agent. Disclaimer, RIP anything good, every single one of these. And if you don't do this, if you break one little foreign agent rule, you get slapped with a fine. And this is where the foreign agent law starts to get weaponized against journalists. One outlet did an interview with Putin's big enemy, Alexei Navalny. Soon after, they got hit with a fine for non-compliance with the foreign agent law. They end up having to pay $340,000 as a fine, which ends up bankrupting them and they had to do like a crowdsourcing campaign to like make the money back. They were almost squashed because of this foreign agent law. This hostile environment for journalists is what led many to leave and come to YouTube. And one of the major pioneers for that was Alexei Navalny. И один из этих зрителей, самый преданный поклонник нашего творчества, по приказу которого меня отравили, Владимир Путин, вот он точно смотрит сейчас, и сердечко его сжимается от ностальгии. I made a whole video about Alexei Navalny and how badass he is as an opponent to Putin and how he used YouTube to like troll Putin while also exposing corruption in Russia. Everybody just uh, watched this and said, oh my God, so that's what you can do on YouTube. That's Michael. He's a Russian YouTuber who you will hear more from in a second. Alexei Navalny showed that you could have huge audiences on YouTube saying things that weren't really allowed to be said anywhere else. And media companies could actually make money without advertisers fleeing because they are foreign agents. In Russia that you don't have a lot of choice if you want to be in media sphere. Как раз из-за того, что СМИ блокировали, разгоняли и выдавливали из медиапространства, интернет в целом стал такой главной площадкой для независимых журналистов. И, соответственно, YouTube стал uh, главной площадкой для видеожурналистов. Another huge pioneer in all of this was this guy, Yuri Dude. He started in 2017 and was an instant hit. The director, now the director, was the director of Volobuyeva. Navalny, after the coma, looks better than I was, in principle, when I was not. Why do you do one and the other do this? Do you understand the opinion of Volobuyeva? They can change themselves. This guy was a sports journalist. He didn't set out to like completely reshape journalism in Russia. But he did. Sex. Like, I watch this stuff and I don't fully know how to make sense of it. It doesn't fit into any box that I'm used to. These videos are super long. We're talking like hour and 56 minutes, 12 million views. Hour and 54 minutes, 22 million views. Yuri Dude's videos are like, I don't know, 60 minutes blended with Anderson Cooper, but mixed with a little Jimmy Kimmel's celebrities read mean tweets. All of this, except for like Anderson Cooper is reading the tweets and he probably wrote some of them too. Also, Anderson Cooper is wearing a hoodie. Oh, and all of this is taking place on YouTube, a website where millions of Russians are watching two and a half hour long interviews with guests they maybe never heard of. I mean, this is wild. Like I'm a YouTuber, I'm a storyteller. I don't understand this. But what I do understand is 10 million subscribers and like 22 million views. This guy paved the way for a new set of Russian voices in an independent space outside of the grasp of the Putin regime. People who watch TV, they believe some things for eight years, while people who watched YouTube, they had totally different opinion. You could find interviews with uh, like politicians, opposition politicians in Russia that you wouldn't otherwise see on TV. Так выстрелил свое время Алексей Навальный, и так выстрелил Юра, потому что это были персонажи в первую очередь, за которыми очень интересно наблюдать и чье мнение интересно было узнать. Another pioneer in this space is Irina Shikman, who I got to talk to for this story. Irina came from TV as well. She was like a traditional host who took the leap to go to YouTube and found freedom. She's a foreign agent. She has to put the foreign agent disclaimer at the front of every one of her videos. I'm a foreign agent, don't give me advertising money. 
squash me and make me feel little because Vladimir Putin hates me. Her videos are incredibly professional and very well done, very interesting conversations. В общем, в какой-то момент мой проект на федеральном телеканале НТВ, это важно для российского зрителя, закрыли, и я оказалась без работы, и моя мой бывший начальник предложил мне делать шоу на Ютубе. По сути, это было, было повторение моего шоу, которое я делала до этого на телевидении. По сути, я как телевизионный журналист перешла с одной э, площадки для вещания на другую. We also got to talk to Karin Shanyan, an openly gay journalist in a country that criminalizes, quote, gay propaganda. Shanyan launched a YouTube channel about queer culture and identity in 2020. Because there is no any other place to uh, put any freedom of speech in Russia. You just can't. Uh, everything is uh, like closed, blocked, and canceled. This is the only platform that is still uh, safe. Russian authorities cannot Technically, they cannot block your uh, YouTube channel. I launched my own YouTube channel, uh, starting with um, a series of interviews with uh, openly queer people. Uh, and I actually started it with like American uh, guests because uh, none of Russian celebrities would even imagine that they can participate in such a project. YouTube was a safe place for a long time. It was the place where these journalists could publish to huge audiences to say what they want, to be able to run a business, to get advertisement. And like I said at the beginning, everyone we talked to, every journalist, is now a foreign agent. They are now on a registry with their name, their birthday, their tax number, and their classification as a foreign agent. And this, this is what's developing right now. The Putin regime has not been savvy enough to really crack down on the internet the same way that maybe China has done. But what they are doing is using this familiar Soviet-style registry to create enemies of the people. The people they don't like, they put on a list. They make them taboo. They make what they have to say not valid anymore. And in doing so, they start to extend their control to these spaces that used to be free. But while YouTube has remained outside of the grasp of Vladimir Putin and his regime, it doesn't mean that it's totally safe. Everything changed on February 24th, when the war started. Единственное, что, конечно, вначале мы никак не могли понять, что нам делать со словом «война», потому что нам запретили его произносить. The main thing that changed is that you need to take a side, you need to choose a side. So if you don't speak about that, you choose the side of Russian government, uh, you choose the side of Russian army and Vladimir Putin, who killed people right now. So it's a, still a position, even if you just mute. Получается, 1 марта, через неделю, фактически после начала войны, нас заблокировали, и из-за угрозы уголовного преследования нам пришлось уехать из России. Within a week of the invasion, the parliament pushed through a series of draconian censorship laws. Things like publishing false information about the Russian government or the Russian military could now land you in prison for 15 years. What this meant is that Russians couldn't call this a war. They had to play by the silly pretend term, special military operation. And this wasn't just on paper. So far, over 4,000 journalists have been prosecuted under these new censorship laws. Modern Putin Russia is more like a jail than a country. I'm not even sure we still have any rights. My rights and freedoms, uh, I feel they are constantly disappearing from Russia. After the invasion, all independent media has either ceased to exist or was physically forced out of country. Someone can actually get arrested and serve time if they just say the word war. No, you didn't mishear me. Just simply war, not even war or war sucks. Because now we have to call it a special operation. Speaking out on social media became dangerous. Journalists fled the country soon after the law was initiated. The censorship became really strong, like way stronger than even before. Me personally, I condemned this war publicly and lost about 100,000 subscribers, just from my opinion. I am really uh, 
shocked by people who are protests now in a good way. They are amazing people. They're really brave persons. That's that's an act of bravery nowadays to go in a protest. Это просто как игра в пятнашки с государством. Мы все это называем большой наградой, и там вообще классная компания собралась в агентах. Ну, люди, за которыми хочется идти и как бы общаться с ними, это прям здоровские ребята. But the Kremlin has stopped short of actually shutting down YouTube, in part because they have an incentive to keep it open. A lot of Russian propagandists use the platform to spread their message. Everyone since the beginning of war has been saying, well, they're going to block YouTube tomorrow, in a week, in two weeks. But there were constant rumors that YouTube was going to be blocked. And guess what? It is not. My theory is that they don't have capacities, capacities in order to block YouTube. They just are not capable of doing that. YouTube is kind of game changer in the modern Russian media landscape. YouTube became like the last bastion of freedom of speech, uh, free from Kremlin censorship here in Russia. Our government wants to close YouTube, but they can't because they, they are afraid of big outrage. It's hard to underestimate the value of YouTube nowadays. Russian-speaking YouTube creators are now in the tough situation, because all the videos shot for the Russian audience are now fully demonetized. But we still continue to make videos, because who else is gonna tell the truth if not us? A lot of us will continue to do what we do, because we do it not for actually views or subscribers, like the count of them, but because we think that it's very important. It was clear to me that it, if you are um, an independent journalist, it is not safe anymore to stay in the country. So I um, flee to uh, first Armenia and later I ended up here in Berlin. And yet, even from afar, they're able to broadcast to their audience and share the truth to be an independent voice in a place that is more and more cut off from information. If it wasn't for Putin and his system, like there's so many people in Russia who can like do really great things. Putin and his peers, they're just not, not, not letting us do that. And it's terrible and tragic. So Vladimir Putin has been in power for 23 years and his goal is finally within reach. His regime today has a near monopoly on information. And while YouTube has been a haven for independent journalists and dissenting voices to be able to share their perspectives, but he's moving in on that too, threatening to punish them if they don't put this big sign on all of their content that says they are influenced by foreign agents. Or what this sign really says, which is that these, these people, these journalists, these voices have been deemed an enemy of the people. I feel the deepest grief uh, and the deepest, you know, guilt and especially responsibility for every murder that happened uh, in Ukraine because of the Russian. Before the war, I never really thought of myself as a patriotic person. And now when I see that my country is destroying another country and it's basically destroying itself, that's painful to watch. In Russia, of course, there's a long way to go. But I do feel like Russia is going like tiny little steps, especially because the young people are having like, all this access to information, like minds are being opened. Thank uh, to YouTube, we have a chance, we have opportunity, even in dictatorship to spread information uh, to people, to people in Russia, not in Russia, every part of the world, even when dictators try to kill every possibility of freedom of speech. Actually, I'm very optimistic. Soon we're gonna see a totally different country or maybe several countries uh, on the territory of Russia. I really like the platform YouTube, but I really want to hope that the future of Russian journalism will be the same channel of information привык весь мир. Мне очень хочется видеть свободное телевидение в России. Peace to Ukraine, freedom for Russia. Hey, thanks for watching. Thank you to the many, many, many Russian people who spoke to me, a lot of them on the condition of anonymity because for obvious reasons, I don't even need to say why. And to the YouTubers who spoke to me, there's so much more uh, in these conversations that I couldn't include. Um, I'm gonna publish 
some of this over on the newsroom. The newsroom is our Patreon, where you can come and support independent journalism here on YouTube. On the newsroom, we publish an extra video every month. The video is a behind the scenes on how we do what we do. And uh, you can see it all. You can see the behind the scenes of this wild and crazy studio and all of the people who are here helping make these videos possible. We also publish uncut interviews and uh, you get uh, royalty free music from our composer Tom Fox. And you uh, get to see my scripts. If you wanna see how my scripts are made, which are not just scripts, they're very involved uh, documents that I use to direct these videos. But most importantly, it's a way to support what we're trying to do here, which is rigorous independent journalism on YouTube, which I don't know if YouTube was ever meant to to support this, but we're finding out. So other ways you can support are purchasing our LUTs and presets, which are the way that we color our videos and photos. We develop those with a professional color, so they're really good. And you can just be here watching the vids, commenting, sharing, doing all the things. Um, I appreciate everyone here and the, the attitude they have of trying to make us all smarter and better and more curious. Um, there's just a lot of that positive energy in this community and I really appreciate it. So. Thank you all. But, and I guess what I'm feeling a lot of right now is just gratitude that I can say whatever I want to say here. And um, I don't have a big, powerful, scary government um, telling me that I'm a foreign agent or that I'm not allowed to say that. I take that for granted and I don't think I should because it's really special that we get to do this. So anyway, um, hope you all are having a good winter and I'll talk to you soon.